this session is one I was just kind of talking about this that was uh, inspired by a youth coach that I met uh, I was working for uh, my friend Ruben at Kaposvar in Hungary uh, he obviously came across the VPI stuff and the phenom stuff and has been wondering how they could use that in their own work developing juniors and things like that and obviously trying to get them either to maybe go to college or to progress into the national teams uh, and the professional rank. So I happened to go see Kyle do a presentation on, on this material at the AVCA back in December. I said, oh, I know just the guy to, to answer these questions. So without further ado, I'll let uh, Kyle get going. He's going to go more presentation style, um, and then we'll, we'll certainly have time to, to get into questions and such along the way. So all yours, Kyle. All right, appreciate it. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, this program, I guess, started, boy, almost 10 years ago now from a conceptual standpoint. Uh, over those 10 years, we've uh, spent a lot of time uh, kind of building out the data and making it more useful. And in the current situation that we're in right now with respect to availability of athletes and uh, kind of creating that funnel that we need in order to find the athletes that uh, fit our programs. I'm hoping that this can be a tool uh, in order for you to use not only with the athletes uh, that you might want to bring into your program, but also the athletes you already have in your program. So I'm going to spend a little time talking about both, but I'm going to start with uh, uh, kind of give you an idea of what has brought us to this point? Uh, before I start on that, just to those of you that don't know who I am, uh, I am a college professor. I, I teach anatomy and physiology. Uh, teach, I've taught courses in bio, biomechanics and kinesiology, and uh, athletic training uh, is my uh, actual profession as well. I'm a, a split faculty, so I'm the head athletic trainer at Iowa Lakes as well. Uh, so I'm involved in, in really all aspects of the athletic department uh, when it comes to both academics as well as athlete development and, uh, of course, the injury prevention and uh, injury recovery processes. So uh, my involvement with AVCA uh, really began as a, uh, I was a vendor uh, for, for some products and then uh, – based on some conversations with Kathy DeBoer, we kind of moved into this project and that's where I've been uh, now for the past five or six years. It's kind of exclusively working on, on this for, for the AVCA. So uh, the data project is kind of a long-term project in order to uh, drill down on uh, some volleyball specific uh, metrics that can help drive decisions in both training and in recruiting and also create a standardized process for that identification. So trying to use the most up-to-date recent technologies uh, as well as uh, standardizing them so they can be replicated and have some uh, essentially we want to make sure that we can trust the data that we're looking at on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, that led into after several thousand athletes on the data project side, it led into a, a database that uh, we're now redesigning again because you guys know how databases go. We were never done uh, with a database, but uh, just so you can kind of see what the database looks like real quick for anybody who hasn't seen it before. And John, I'll let you tell me if any of these things aren't uh, coming up on the screen like they should. But uh, this leaderboard is available okay, right through. Right now, I, don't, I only see this slide right now, Kyle. Okay. I'm only uh, seeing the slide, see. the history slide. Let me see if I can jump out of the presentation and then I'll bring this one up on, the, on that same screen. Try this one. How's that? Yep, there we go. Okay, so within this leaderboard, 
this is available through the AVCA website. So you just use your normal credentials to log in as an AVCA member. And then once in here, uh, we can navigate through uh, a certain number of, of uh, characteristics or uh, funnels, you might say. Uh, so for instance, we'll go back to our last phenom, which was Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm looking for a 2021 uh, middle hitter and it'll bring up just that group of athletes. It'll show me how many fit that criteria that were in that event. I can make that as broad or as narrow as I wish. Uh, the main component here is the VPI, of course, and we know from uh, historical data, specifically with the Phenom program, that of those Phenom athletes, which we usually have 300 uh, per year at Phenom, and we're looking at including more athletes this next year just based on the lack of the spring season and trying to give more athletes the chance to be seen. Uh, but we know that 77% of the kids we choose to be in the Phenom program end up on college rosters. Uh, so there's a, a, a real direct relationship between the talent that's at these, the, the Phenom events specifically, uh, these are by invitation, and 50% of those athletes end up on a D1 roster. Uh, so the VPI score here, we've determined over the years that a VPI of 525 or higher generally means college ready for uh, a middle, an outside, uh, a right side, uh, a little bit lower for uh, your setters and your, your specialists, DS and libero specialists, mainly because of the height factor, the anthropometric factor that tend not to run true. But uh, what I want to look at here, let's just pick an athlete. Um, we'll pick this one. If you select on an athlete, uh, then you're going to see uh, some information. And the information that you can look at gives you some percentile rankings uh, that make up their VPI score related to other VPI. So here you can see a college average and 80, 80th percentile of college athletes, how they rank up percentage wise. You can see this athlete is a high scoring athlete primarily because of uh, arm swing speed, uh, pro agility and her vertical and block touch. So you can see that on the other side of the coin, she really lags behind in height and reach and attack and, attack height. And we'll get into those things when I talk about profiling athletes that fit your program. What is it exactly you're looking for? So we can see their rank against these college average uh, information. If you want to see what the athlete looks like, we've just put in a, a real short little uh, video here uh, that will show one swing of the athlete just so you can get your eyes on them. And, and you can learn a lot from that just from a movement uh, skill set and and uh, sometimes it takes that to either to rule an athlete out or to say yeah I'm really interested in that athlete. There's also a college comparison page. Uh, the blue is the athlete. It just gives you a visual of what part of their VPI score is contributing the most to their score and how that compares. Uh, if you hover on one, it tells you what they're comparing it against. It's basically just a a visual of the same uh, benchmark data. Uh, that we had before. And then also within the VPI, uh, Kathy likes this behavioral analysis. So we use the, uh, the disc profile that you may have seen before. Uh, that will give you an idea of what their volleyball behavior and, and nat uh, natural behaviors are, if that interests you at all as a coach. So uh, that's kind of a look at, at what the uh, database can do for you uh, when you're looking at specific athletes and you're selecting those down, I'll jump back into my presentation here. Oops, I need to get rid of that. So as we look at the VPI, I've listed them out here, uh, what we just got done looking at in four categories, height, reach, as far as anthropometrics, uh, jump with vertical and block touch, speed, attack, personality. These are your 
components that make up the VPI. With that in mind, the development of that obviously came out of uh, multiple conversations about what matters and what doesn't matter. What are other sports doing? How can we relate it to, to volleyball specifically? Uh, what can we learn from those things? What tests are we doing now that aren't really standardized, like a, like a jump touch test or things like that that we see come out of clubs or high schools that we may not trust entirely uh, because of standardization? So uh, if anybody has additional questions on the specifics of any of these tests, you can sure reach out to me. Uh, or uh, there's some definitions on the website as well. The other interesting thing that's going to be helpful as we run through this presentation is calculating scores for your own athletes or even yourself, if you wish. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is an app that we've created for both uh, iOS as well as Android, and it's available in both of those stores. Uh, if you just uh, go in there and you search for uh, the ABCA sample calculator, VPI sample calculator. Uh, this is what you'll get. Uh, download it. Just sits on your phone. There's nothing sent to anyone. Uh, there, we're not collecting data from here, uh, although that is a goal down the road to be able to do that. This basically allows you to take a look at athletes that are on your roster plug in some data. You can use it for training in the summer. You can use it for benchmarks during the year. Uh, but the individual tests show what the uh, numeric should be for the metric. They put it in, and then you can either get a partial VPI score based on the things you know and compare athletes by individual metric, or you can get the composite with the sample VPI scores listed there. So uh, uh, something that uh, if you want to play around with it and kind of see how these contribute to an overall VPI, this index, volleyball, ball, volleyball performance index, if you're going to liken it to anything, it's a standardized test like an SAT or an ACT where all the components kind of merge together to create this overall score. And we're going to talk a little bit about how those individual tests can impact the score uh, in a few minutes here. So any questions on the VPI itself before I move into uh, kind of looking at recruiting and training? Nothing has come in so far. Okay, um, good. Okay. Anything you want me to expand on there, John? Uh, probably not the right choice because I've been through this. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no. Okay. No, go ahead. All right. Let's talk about the recruiting side of this. Uh, the reality is, is anytime we're looking at metrics, not only are you trying to recruit athletes that can increase uh, the assets on your team, and from my perspective, that's a data-driven uh, decision, but at the same time, you have to reevaluate the athletes that are currently on your team and see what you can do to raise your own asset score within your team on a VPI on a daily, weekly, monthly, seasonal basis. So we're going to look at it from both, both standpoints. And anytime you're doing an asset mapping of your roster, you've got to drill down the details that are going to contribute to you reaching your target. And you as a coach in recruiting – have to determine what your target is. Is it a national championship? Is it a conference championship? Is it trying to get this team I'm rebuilding back to 500? I don't know what that is. That's what you have to decide for yourself. So if we think about uh, this idea of, of asset mapping, because any data that we can provide is only as good as you being able to put it in context with your own program. So identifying your cohort first, are you comparing your program against your conference, your NCA region or your NJCA region, or uh, however it is that you make the playoffs, if it's a high school and you've got a section or whatever that might be, uh, how do you get out of that? Uh, again, is it, is it only within your conference and you want to try to achieve a, a record and you're looking at other uh, teams that are at that level and you want to match them? Uh, tournament appearances, championships, like I mentioned. Once you've decided what your cohort is for the near term, then you can do some research on identifying what it is you need in your roster and your statistical uh, 
activity to try to match what they're doing. Uh, this is one of those kind of scary tactics because if your asset map says you're better in every way except for the win-loss category, then that's probably an introspective turn that you've got to take and figure out what can I do from a coaching philosophy to make that happen. But uh, most of the time, we're all aware, we've all been coaching long enough to know that, man, you got to have athletes. And if we can drill down to the type of athlete that's going to fill the holes in our asset map, then we can improve uh, our effectiveness as a coach. So when I say identify the benchmark, if you look up and down your roster and compare it to that cohort of teams or the cohort of success, maybe it's your own program in the past, uh, but if you can identify where the holes are in that roster, is it size? Is it simple explosiveness, arm swing speed, vertical jump? Uh, is it experience is it what is it that's that makes your roster different than the ones that are beating you right now or if you're already at the top what do i have to do to stay there same same thing applies uh statistical significance if i'm struggling because i am not digging any first balls or i'm struggling because i can't get a hand on a ball defensively at the net so i've got a blocking issue and statistical bear that out time after time after time, then identify what can I go find in the VPI to help plug that hole. Uh, and I mentioned historical perspective as well, too. If your team itself is just not performing as well as previous teams, uh, what am I missing either statistically or within the roster uh, from, a, uh, from an athletic standpoint in order to make that, make that jump? So identify your benchmarks first. Once you've got that uh, benchmark identified, then you can go back into that PV or VPI category uh, that I looked at a few minutes ago. And I can take that individual benchmark for an athlete that I'm recruiting and see what actually creates, uh, what, what they're going to create in my roster to fill a hole. If it's play at the net, maybe I need an extra three inches on my front line. Uh, or if it's attack, maybe I need somebody who's got a vertical jump that's, you know, four inches better than what I've got right now. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that an athlete comes up with a 600 BPI score. And the best way you can learn it is to go into that database and kind of sort through it and see that I can have a 600 BPI, but I might be 5'7 with a huge vertical and a huge explosive arm, but is that what my team needs? Do I need a 600 because they're six foot three and have a huge reach, is that what is going to turn my, my team around or improve my roster from an asset standpoint? Uh, and sometimes that goes back to your cohorts. How do they fit into that, uh, that data scheme as well? We also have uh, published VPI benchmarks that are available on the AVCA site uh, that will break down the data that we've collected over the last eight to 10 years by D1, uh, D2, uh, uh, JUCO level, uh, it breaks it down by position, by test. And when you get a good uh, record of your own roster currently, you can see right where those athletes fit into that by position individually and even by team. Uh, so that data is available on the ABCA website too. It's not hard to find. You just click on the ABCA VPI and it's, it's all right there. You can click through on it. So I won't waste your time by uh, showing you how to click buttons on the screen, but uh, know that it is there and it can be a valuable, valuable asset in determining whether or not your team is living up to the uh, expectations that you have for them. Uh, and then I mentioned statistical already. Uh, just the thing I caution with statistical uh, comparisons is to make sure that it makes sense for your goals. You, you can't say, I hope to get 500 in my conference, but then use a whole bunch of national tournament statistics in order to, uh, to evaluate your current roster. Uh, so take those short-term goals in order to make a long-term change. Once in the recruiting uh, scene, you've identified those weaknesses, whether it's lateral agility, lateral movement, whether it's uh, vertical jump and power, whether it's simply uh, size of the athletes that you have. It really comes down to a coach's meeting 
And if that coach is just you and you're the whole staff, then you got to be uh, confident in what you're doing. If you have a large staff that includes strength and conditioning and athletic training and all those things, and you can have a, a major conversation about what direction you want to go to fill these weaknesses. Uh, decide on the qualities you're looking for, and then go into that VPI and start looking for those athletes. Uh, use the sort buttons. Use the every single one of those headings by test. You can sort high to low, low to high, uh, and find something that fits that category, whether it's multiple categories or individual categories, in order to – Uh, create a funnel that better matches your program. Uh, And as I said, at the Phenom program that we run in conjunction with the ABCA convention every year, uh, that is the best place to see our best high school athletes that are uncommitted. And many of them are repeaters. So you can see their data from the previous year, uh, and then we can look at improvements, and you can also identify them before you even show up when you get a chance to watch them play. This is also a time uh, for your staff to confirm statistics you've looked at, to uh, bring up additional issues that they might have within the the type of athlete you've been getting and the direction that they want to go and and so forth. It's it's just a good way to uh, get everybody on the same page as you move forward and have to make this critical decision. And that critical decision is develop or recruit. Do we have freshmen that we can develop in the weight room and develop on the court and develop with experience to fill those holes? Uh, Or do we not have a chance and we need to go recruit some different athletes to make that happen? Hopefully this is a, uh, not a either or, hopefully it's an and. Hopefully we can develop and recruit and we can use the VPI to do both. Uh, Prioritize those needs and then when you go out on the recruiting trail, focus, don't be distracted, stick with what you know you need in order to fill those holes and and create a better asset map to move you towards your goal. And as I said, the VPI can be a a huge component in that identification. Even if the athlete's not in the database, with that tool that uh, is a free sample calculator, you can ask a recruit for information to put into that calculator or ask them to download it and send you a screenshot of the data that they put in. Now, obviously we know that's not standardized and we know we have to have a little bit of trust in that, but the reality is it can give you a good indication of where that athlete falls uh, within the rest of that data, whether it's benchmarking or whether it's uh, within the database itself. So in closing on the recruiting side of this, Always dedicate yourself to your your identified needs. The database, the VPI database makes that possible. Uh, Make sure you have agreement across your staff as to who you're looking for. We don't want to end up in a lot of different directions. Uh, It's sometimes good to have that whiteboard that's in the office, have those priorities listed from a metric standpoint. We have minimums. We're not recruiting any athletes that don't meet this minimum, and if you think we need to, then you need to make the case and bring it in and sell it to the entire staff, why this athlete fits, even though they don't meet a minimum VPI. Uh, One thing that I've seen in talking to coaches that use this method is that really avoids them getting into their old habits of going after the same player because they've just got this, uh, this, when they walk into a gym, they're looking for the same thing all the time, and if it's not getting them the results that they want, this is something that kind of set that on its ear and give everybody a voice and in, in who we're going after. Uh, and then verify, obviously. Seek the athlete, utilize the database, ask for, ver- ask for the data if you don't have it in the database, but then verify it. Uh, in this day and age with COVID-19, everybody is Zooming and everybody's videoing and everybody's FaceTiming. Have an athlete set up a FaceTime and just have them show you them doing the test. And if they can't get into a gym, if they can't get into a space where they can have multiple players, just those movement patterns alone can verify uh, uh, your idea of whether or not that athlete fits the profile you're looking for and to see if it matches the data that they provide to you. So use technology. John and I were discussing it before. This is a, this is a great way to move past kind of our traditional means and ways that we've always recruited in the past. 
And then in closing on that, I'll just bring up this. This is just a screenshot of that database. And the idea here is that I have, what, two, four, six, seven athletes that all fall within a two-point range on the VPI. But if you look at the actual statistics, I have a height range here that goes from five, five foot seven all the way up to six foot and a half inch. I have reaches from seven foot three all the way to almost eight feet. So you can see that there are huge discrepancies in individual tests. And that's what I mean by deciding the profile you're looking for before you go into the database and just start scrolling through. Uh, are you looking for somebody that's got a big arm, a big swing, a 42 mile an hour swing, a uh, nice quick agility, but hmm, they're only five, seven. We've already decided that's a problem. So I know coaches never want to turn away athletes. We'll find a place for them. That's what we always say. Uh, but the reality is if we end up with a whole team of athletes that we're trying to find a place for, we may not get to the desired outcome that we're looking for. So before I get into training, any questions on the recruiting side? Um, I guess one question that I would toss out there. How early would you start having the athletes test? I mean, is there, is there any sort of sense of what's too early? From an, from an age standpoint, that's, your, that's yeah, what you mean. Yeah, exactly. We limited our testing to athletes over the age of 14 when we started. Uh, primary reason was just sheer numbers. When you get down into the 11, 12, and 13 range, absolutely everybody wants to test. And their movement, their ability to take direction and follow that direction in a very, very precise way was was difficult when we did ran some tests with with girls and boys that were younger than that uh, and we also saw that the discrepancy uh, in in height and skill level just from a volleyball standpoint was so wide at that 10 11 12 age range that we didn't trust the data is that i hope that makes sense but from a from a scientific standpoint it would have been fantastic to be able to follow those 10 or 11 year olds all the way to age 18. But the reality was uh, from the overall goal of our database to be able to provide right now, real time information, it didn't fit into that goal. If we had a, if we had a funded research study, I would love to go test those athletes and see how the ones who were, you know, six inches taller than their cohort at the age of 12 actually turned out when they were 18. I would love to know that. Uh, but the reality is it, that that's going to take a lot more athletes and a lot more uh, time. And this program just didn't have the funding for that or the uh, overall goal when we started for that. So we, we set it at 14. You basically need to be entering high school in order to get into the database. All right. But so somebody locally could certainly do their own. Oh, for sure. And use the app or whatever. For to, sure. I can tell you that. With my children, my daughter's a junior in college now, and I started doing this when she was in, in middle school. And I definitely tested her and her friends when they were, you know, 11 and 12 years old just to see what the data was like. But it also proved very valuable when I was still working with them when they were 15 and 16 years old to see the progress. So, yeah, definitely. If you're running a club, uh, if you uh, are a parent, if you take that sample calculator and start using it as motivation now. There's no reason not to. None of these tests are dangerous. None of them take very long time. Most of them are fun. Nothing in here is grueling. There's no mile runs. Uh, hopefully you're not doing that anyway, but that's for another session. Uh, but, but there's none of that kind of stuff in here. It's all fun, quick, running through it in five minutes, and you got to score. Yeah, I think a lot of the stuff is, is fairly standard. Um, I know, like you said, you got descriptions on the website. It looked like in the app there's also information on what Correct. each of the tests um, if, if something some gets put in it's out of range right? say that again I think this that you show some alternatives right as well Correct. Yeah. so if, if you don't have well, for instance we use vert for our vert testing we use modus for our arm swing stuff if you don't have those technologies available we have alternatives in there for how to get a score in order to put in there yeah, I think the arm swing one is probably the one a lot of people would probably struggle with on their own. Yeah, it's a tough one. It's a tough one because radar guns are not great uh, when we're trying to 
to get a volleyball off of a, a hand. Uh, you could, I could post a video of Karch making fun of me trying to use a radar gun in the middle of a court with a middle all American and getting my <laughs> bell rung. Uh, so that's not, that's, that's hazard pay when you go down and do that. So, uh, and also the data is not great. So, and also understand a lot of these technologies, uh, can be in short supply right now because they're all imported. They're not. Uh, produced mm-hmm. here in the United States. So right now we've got a, a real issue with availability. So uh, hopefully that eases soon, but just understand that that's in place. If, if you really want to do it with a MODIS and you really want to do it with a VERT and you can't get your hands on one, uh, we'd be more than willing to, to get you a package to get some testing done if, if you get it back to us. Yeah. Oh, there you go. And for, for small countries, uh, I mean, this was something that I was thinking about with, res- with respect to England. Maybe the clubs can get together, pitch in, and just do something jointly. For sure. You know, uh, one day of testing or something along those lines. Yeah, uh, we, just out of curiosity. Is, okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, from a time standpoint, just so it's understood, we when we do Phenom, we test those 300 athletes uh, over the period of about five and a half to six hours. We can get through 300 athletes on a rotation basis with four stations. Uh, so if you're testing 50 kids, you can get through 50 kids in 25 minutes easily. Gotcha. Uh, just out of curiosity, for is there any sort of uh, weighting to the VPI components, or are they basically all equally weighted? And is uh, there a difference between uh, positions? No, we've weighted them equally. We started out messing around with the weighting and then realized that because every coach values – them differently, any weighting we did would potentially work directly against any coach. Let's say I wanted to to uh, uh, make the impact of the height of the athlete less because that is one of those things that is standard. And if you're six foot five as a female, well, that's going to put you at the very top. And you might not be able to put one foot in front of the other, but you're going to have a high VPI score. Right. But then that's what some coaches value. If that's what they really want and they want to work with it, then we need to have that athlete show up as being at the top of the, of, at the top because of that anthropometric. Uh, on the other hand, some coaches don't seem to care that much about three step speed or something like that. But if we lower that, we might have other coaches that do. So we didn't wait simply because it was easier to uh, explain and then it allowed coaches to make their own decisions about what was important to them and what was not, which is why we have it in there so you can sort by specific test if you want to. Okay. Um, I think that's all That's all the questions I have. Uh, we haven't had okay. any come in, so let's carry on. All right. Let's get into to training here real quickly. This, The training is, is, is a lot of fun. Recruiting can be a grind, and, and uh, uh, but the data when we use it on the training side can be a lot of fun with athletes. Um, I've got a couple of uh, editorial comments as a uh, as an athletic trainer for the last 20 years, uh, working primarily with female athletes uh, and and volleyball players specifically. And that's this first one is that we need to create a program that will number one prioritize danger and try to create an injury prevention program for our athletes. Uh, that's number one. Whether it's acute or chronic injuries and so forth. And I'll give you kind of a a guideline for being able to do that in any setting. Uh, We need to create foundational workloads associated with how often, how much, and what we're doing, both on the court, in the weight room, and maybe even athletes on their own. We also need to create a certain amount of individual planning. based on the expectations that we have for athletes. Not every middle you have on your roster is the same. You might have different expectations for uh, each one of them, and those are going to be different than the expectation you have for your setter. So uh, foundational workload for the entire team, foundational program for the entire team, but use the VPI to create individual goals and individual plans for athletes once you get to that point. And probably the most important is make sure you're using a program you trust. Don't just turn it over to somebody else and say, these are the things that I want to have accomplished. I don't care how you do it, just get it done. 
it, you're trying to merge these athletes into your gym on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, they have to come to your court. They have to compete. And you need to know what they're doing and, and have, a, have an iron in the fire, too. So make sure you've done your own research on the methods that either somebody else is using with your athletes or that you're instituting. Uh, just don't take somebody else's off-season conditioning uh, binder that you got as a GA and continue to use that for the next 15 years. Uh, it needs to be a viable and uh, ever-changing product because your roster is ever-changing. That's the biggest thing I have to get across uh, beyond prioritizing injury is to make sure that you are willing to make manipulations in that program based on how your roster changes. Changes. And then always, always, always pay attention to the ancillary factors. And by that, I mean sleep, diet, uh, recovery time, how they manage their workload when they're not with you. Are they always doing extra things? Are they working against you from a body composition standpoint? These ancillary factors have the biggest impact on everything else that I just stated. Uh, you get them for a very limited amount of time and they have a lot of time to destroy what it is we're trying to do, uh, either intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, and I would say as an athletic trainer, most of my frustration comes from athletes who don't understand nutrition or don't prioritize sleep and rest. So, uh, make sure that's built into your program. Uh, but first let's look at how to use the VPI here yeah, from a training standpoint. Like I said, it's easy to test. The conversation we just had, it doesn't take long. If each of your individual athletes knows their individual VPI, that's power for them. Uh, they have the app on their phone. They can type in what changes in my VPI. If I add two inches to my vertical, if I add four inches to my block touch, what's that do to my VPI? What's it do to our positional VPI? You can create percentage change competition within your uh, within your team. You can create team goals that can be put on the whiteboard and in the, in the locker room and the strength and conditioning facility, whatever it might be, but use it as a, uh, an, use it as a method to create interest and also to create buy-in from your athletes. Uh, so create those, those goal VPIs for the athletes that are currently on your roster. Make sure they understand what you expect as a coach. If you want their VPI to increase, you want it to increase because of blank. And when they understand specifically what it is you want from them to be a, a more integral part of the team, you'll get better feedback from them on a day-to-day -day basis as to how hard they're working. They understand they're going to be tested again. The idea for them is, uh, is more on the front of their mind than when they walk into the strength and conditioning facility. It's not just, oh, I'm tired. Let's get this workout done. Let's get out of here. Uh, they can have this one thing to focus on. And I do that with my athletes all the time. When they come in, it might be something different week to week, but I always give them something specific that they can focus on rather than just, we got to get better. We got to get better. We got to get better. What does that mean? And then using the VPI uh, creates this communication dialogue invokes work, allows you to verify through testing, and then you repeat it over again. So create this kind of cycle of success, utilizing the VPI uh, as a target in all these situations. So as I said, I have an editorial here real quick, and I think this is information that's important for every coach to know. Number one, protect your roster by building a foundation that is built on strength and balance first, and then agility and power second. If we can do those two things, we will see increases in nearly every component of the VPI. And in my years working with female athletes, even at the college level, uh, we have deficits in sometimes three out of those four categories, uh, even as they come in as college athletes. And so if you want a a big change in your VPI scores right away, it's create that foundational strength and balance and then agility power. Not only will you lose less days to injury, uh, but it makes it easier to do those individual programs and get the, the gains that you're, you're desiring. Uh, in order to do that, research shows that it doesn't matter if it's a 10-year-old, like we talked about previously, or if it's an Olympic athlete, 
if you give three times a week and you do it for longer than five months and you do it for 10 minutes each of those times, you get the same improvement whether they are 10 years old or they are 25 years old. And that is a uh, motor engram theory that, that we create that allows uh, consistency. We don't graduate kids from this, uh, but it will create definite changes in all aspects of performance uh, that we've talked about. And it will also create a, uh, a, almost a team unifying experience that this is, the, this is what we do. Uh, there's a lot of different resources for these lower prevent lower extremity injury prevention program. You can go out there and search for them. But University of Wisconsin and Sanford, I use kind of a combination of those two, but there's a hundred other ones out there uh, that are all good. Uh, but we have to train athletes to be efficient in their movement if we want them to reach their maximum. Okay, I just finished a, a, a lecture on heredity and genetics last week. And one of the topics we talked about was reaching the maximum potential of your genetic profile. And if we don't have the things we talked about before, like sleep, diet, and uh, taking care of yourself, you won't get it. And if we don't pay attention to strength, balance, agility, and power, we don't achieve it. We work with a lot of athletes that are massively gifted from a genetic standpoint. And I would challenge you to try to get to the maximum for every one of those athletes from a genetic standpoint. And uh, this is the, the first step in doing that. As you deliver the athletic performance program, that's our base performance program. We create a sound philosophy that focuses on uh, integral or uh, incremental change. Uh, we use the VPI again, as I stated, to, to create these targets uh, that will be important for holding athletes accountable for what you expect. And it also makes recruiting easier. Uh, if you have athletes that are actually achieving targets that you give them, now you see firsthand in your gym what that VPI score looks like. Uh, now the elephant in the room that we haven't talked about is volleyball proficiency. And that's where you as a coach come in. I, I'm not a coach. I mean, I am a coach, but I'm, I'm not in this situation. I am data. I am VPI. I'm providing uh, some information about uh, what makes an athlete uh, better from a physical standpoint. Uh, but we also have to pay attention, obviously, to their volleyball proficiency. I can't take someone who's never touched a ball and tell you that they're a 590 and you have to recruit them. Uh, but what you will see in your gym is how much easier it is to, uh, for these athletes to do the things you ask them to do when they reach the targets that you've set. And uh, it's a learning experience for you as a coach, just like it is for them as an athlete. Uh, these are long-term changes that create long-term changes in your program. So, again, we go back to this idea of test, modify, 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 test, repeat. If you're using progressive overload and the said principle, you're making sure that the, the program that they're doing is directly related to the goals that you have, then you should be able to test and repeat and test and repeat and get improvements. Uh, it's, it's that age-old frustration where I get freshmen in and they make big gains right away. And then it seems like they stall out for the next three and a half years. And we have to make sure that that doesn't happen by paying attention to what it is we're trying to change. Every athlete has something they can get better at. And hopefully you can use the VPI to identify where you can focus those changes in order to make them uh, a better uh, member of your team, but also to change kind of the trajectory of your roster uh, from now moving forward. All identified needs are based on weaknesses uh, for the most part initially, but once we address these weaknesses, now we can start looking at strengths and make those even better. Uh, those individual modifications are where that comes from. So either positionally or individually, you have to be willing to take the time uh, within drills and skills in the gym to target those with, like I said, the said principle or progressive overload, have high, ex high expectations for those things that you expect your athletes to get better uh, at doing. And then this last caveat, 
being mindful of the necessary time that it takes, we don't make these changes in a week and we don't make them in two weeks. Sometimes we can make some quick neural adaptations in three or four weeks, but if we're gonna have long-term change in the positive direction, we need to have a minimum time frame of six to eight weeks before we can really rely on changes we've made. So again, a lot of times with our season on the female side and the women's volleyball side, we're gonna to try to make these changes in the spring and summer uh, because we can't do it when they report in the fall. Uh, we can make changes, skills and drills and get better at those types of things. But if we really wanna make uh, overriding changes in that VPI score uh, from a power and a speed standpoint, that's probably gonna to have to happen in an off season period. Uh, just strictly because of that that minimum time frame. It, the caveat would be if you have athletes come in that are seriously detrained, then obviously that's not the case. But then also be mindful of time necessary for negative change. It only takes half the amount of time uh, to go backwards from a strength and power standpoint. The motor engrams typically always stay there. They can remember the sequence of events in the kinematic chain, and they can understand uh, the skills even after they, you know, the old riding the bike analogy, but the power and the athletic development can certainly go negative very quickly. So uh, holding this VPI score, uh, holding them accountable for that during those times is extremely important. So I'll leave that screen up there if you have any questions, uh, John, on that uh, uh, training aspect of it. There's a lot there and a lot of it really relies on what role we play as a coach. Am I in charge of everything? Do I farm this out to somebody else? But, but bottom line is you need to hold athletes accountable. Yeah, you, you kind of answered at the end one of the questions that I was going to have in terms of how often to test. And it sounds like basically it's, it's based on the periodization of, of your training program. Yeah, I, was, I usually set my testing. If it's, you also have to understand that testing is a snapshot. Whether it's phenom, we'll have kids that come in and just just blow it out in, in phenom, and even surprise themselves at how well they do. And then we'll also have athletes that say, "Man, I would really want to do that again tomorrow." I woke up this morning, I didn't sleep well last night. My flight got in late, and I know they didn't perform as well as they could. So. I, I'm more of a proponent for more frequent testing so you can kind of see the ebb and flow of that athlete. Because uh, if you only test once every six or seven weeks, you're not allowing for their good days and their bad days to see where they are. Uh, so I, I'm a proponent. Like I said, this thing is pretty easy. Most of this stuff is not difficult to set up. If an athlete asks if they can test, yeah, give them a shot. Let's even if they tested seven days ago. Let's see where you're at. Maybe they've been sleeping better. They want to see how that affects them. They just feel better. Give them a chance to test over and over again. Because the higher you can get their VPI up there, the higher you can set the goals and your expectations to move them up. Well, yeah, and I, I would imagine that if, if you're open like that, obviously assuming that there's no impact on other things that you've got going on, which sure. are bigger priorities, it feeds into their motivation, which can't be a, a bad thing. You Never. Know, if we got them targeted, then go for it. That's uh, the, the, the biggest that, issue. Yeah. The biggest issue is motivation. And if you can yeah. create motivation for college women to uh, make it a priority, whatever, whatever technology, whatever asset it takes. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would uh, just want to toss out there was um, the differentiation between, let's say, physical development speed power development from lifting programs and, and those sorts of things and technical efficiency, just executing the movement patterns better to generate faster arm swing, more explosive jump, whatever that, that might be. Yep. Uh, the, the strategy that I uh, prescribe in those situations is to make sure that they have the availability to do the skills that you want them to become more efficient at doing while we're also achieving these goals in the weight room and in the, in the summer program and things like that. If I take an athlete 
and I say, yes, let's get our, our vertical jump up three inches, but they never take a swing in those six or seven weeks because maybe they're someplace where they don't have anybody to work. Or right now, our athletes are all hunkered down. Uh, that doesn't mean they can't lift or find some way to get better at the vertical jump, but are they actually creating peak height attacks? If the two aren't happening together, then you're going to have exactly the problem you're talking about. Uh, we know that, that being better, uh, being more efficient in movement allows us to gain these skills faster from a motor learning standpoint. Uh, because I have better association, better kinesthetic awareness, if, I, if my uh, muscle tone is higher, if those things are, are more excitable, then yes, I get better at that faster. But the reality is it goes back to the said principle. If I don't have specific adaptation to the demand, then I essentially have to go and relearn that skill. So as a coach, figuring out some way to give them the opportunity to take swings, to uh, do maximum effort skill building at this same time. And that, that's a struggle right now. And all, I mean, that's probably a, a topic uh, that could be better covered by some coaches that are out there doing it, you know, either creating video profiles. But at the high school level, we've had huge restrictions placed on us. We're not even supposed to be able to communicate with high school athletes other than to say, hey, are you doing, are you doing well? We're not supposed to be able to film anything and send it to them for training and things like that. So there's restrictions out there that are going to make this difficult. In a perfect world, they're coming from the weight room into the gym or from the gym into the weight room or something like that. We've got a very close proximity that uh, allows skill building on top of the power and speed and balance building that we're doing. I'm a huge fan of incorporating the two. Uh, if I can teach passing in multiple positions, uh, things that would be considered uh, out of balance or uh, maybe non-traditional positions. And, I'm, and I, that way I can single leg balance, uh, single arm uh, passing, those types of things. If we can involve them together, then that accelerates what you're talking about. Uh, so there's a lot of factors that go into it. And, and right now we're not in a good position over these last six weeks or maybe the next six weeks to develop those things together. Unfortunately. Right. Um, just going back to the, the, the testing, uh, have you, have, have you analyzed players beyond college or, or collected data on players during college or is it uh, pretty much just stops at college right now? No, in the early stages of our database of our data set, uh, development, we tested, uh, close to 180, uh, athletes that were trying out for the U.S. Olympic team. Uh, so that's that's a kind of a core data set for us that we've moved forward with. Uh, we've talked about doing it again, but the reality is once the data is in there, the data is what it is, and we can make adjustments moving forward uh, based on how the data changes. But uh, that group exists, and then we did multiple, uh, like, D1 spring tournaments. We did uh, uh, – we did – NAIA national tournament teams one year at the national tournament. Uh, we did uh, junior college, one of their big tournaments. Uh, so we, we have data sets on all those groups that have gone into creating those benchmarks uh, that we've discussed. So that's real data uh, from more than just a team here, a team there. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, probably close to a thousand athletes that are, that were current college players or beyond when we did the testing. Yeah, I was just thinking for, for places where, you know, outside the U.S. primarily, where either you're looking at maybe professional leagues or high-level semi-pro leagues or whatever, and they, maybe they don't think there's necessarily a, a direct correlation to, say, college athletes. They can yep. do their own benchmarking. For sure. And we've got, we've got enough male athletes in the system now that we've got, if it's a male league, uh, that we've got some data to look at, but I, I would, I would be more than interested in assisting them to try to, to gather that data. And we've had multiple requests to do that. It's just never really come together to be able to either send somebody out and teach and observe or have somebody, uh, pull the trigger on and say, yeah, let's get this done for our league. But, but, uh, obviously the data set that exists would not be terribly useful for them. 
but everything we've talked about from a training standpoint and a motivation standpoint and understanding who you're bringing into that professional league, it all dovetails perfectly. Sure. All right. And I'd be more than willing to discuss the possibility. Yeah, for sure. Okay, you were going to finish up talking about Phenom, I think? Yep, I just wanted a, a few things about Phenom. For instance, here's my son. He's a senior this year. So he's going to miss out on – he missed out on a track season, a baseball season, uh, college or high school graduation, those types of things. And I bring him up primarily – because that's my email address there too if anybody has uh, a reason to contact me. But I bring that up because we're in a situation right now where – Phenom is going to be one of the, the best areas where coaches on the women's college side are going to be able to see athletes. Uh, we're in discussions to expand Phenom uh, from the typical 300 to a, to a higher number in Omaha next year. Uh, now all this is obviously predicated on things getting back more back to a new normal where we can actually have an event like this, but we're all aware that even the fall seasons right now are – uh, a subject uh, of conversation at NCAA, NJCA, high school association levels. And it may not be the same from state to state. We may have some states that don't play. We have some states that do. What we want to be able to do is provide an opportunity for the best players, no matter what state they're from. And we get them from Canada. and We get them from other areas, too, that come into this uh, phenom program. And if you can utilize – your recruiting budget to get to convention because we have this program that's offered. Uh, if your budgets are a little tight on the operations side, uh, we want to be able to provide you with the idea that you can come there and see 450 athletes, whereby 300 of them are going to be D1 players. And they could be stacking years. So you can start recruiting your, your 22s and your 23s, but there's going to be a number of 21s that are there looking to be signed as well. So the Phenom program has really become the crown jewel of, uh, of kind of the, uh, the visual optic that coaches can get in and actually see what's going on uh, within, the, within the data set and within the uh, data that comes in, but then also be able to correlate that the following day to how that athlete participates on the court. So if we do the testing on Saturday or Friday, we do the testing on Friday, we make that testing available before they start their showcase on Saturday so a coach can go through the process I just went through, identify the athletes they want to see, and they can see the correlation right away the next day as to what that athlete looks like on the floor. Uh, so we would love to be able to expand that into other places too. If we have other events where we can create programs like that, you've mentioned other countries several times, if they have some type of a clearinghouse like that, where they want to create this, get in touch with us and we'll see what we can put together. Yeah. Uh, just out of curiosity, what's the selection process for getting into Fino? Uh, there's a couple of political things, like a high school coach needs to be part of the ABCA in order to get this thing started. Uh, but the reality is is, is they, sub they either have tested with us previously and they've met a minimum score. If they do that, they're in. Uh, but otherwise, it's, uh, it's a referral process. So either from a coach uh, that saw them play, uh, even if college coaches have athletes that uh, they've seen play and they'd like to get them to this location, they can, you know, send a request into the office and we can try to work backwards to get those athletes uh, into the Phenom program. But most of them come from grassroots. Uh, the ABCA office sends out requests starting now for next, uh, next December, and then uh, coaches can submit uh, applicants and then we – turn around and contact that applicant for some more information. Could be statistical, uh, could be metric data like we have right now. Uh, but the reality is, is they have to meet some criteria as a varsity athlete or they have to meet criteria as a, a ones type of an athlete on a, on a club system or something like that. And how can they get uh, – because you mentioned one of the criteria or one of the selection processes could be you have prior testing from them. Yeah. So how could they how could they get testing results to you, or how could they get tested by you? 
Well, the <clears throat> we have several clubs across the country that are currently doing testing, so that's one way. That's not as widespread as we want it to be, and we're working to uh, to develop that out further. Like I said, this spring, all that stuff ended. So this is the progress we make over the last couple of years uh, kind of got the brakes uh, yeah. put on. So that's that's going to be a problem this next fall. So I'm, I'm putting it out there from the standpoint that if you have athletes that you want to be in that phenom program, we lost that one component. So uh, this, uh, again, you can submit to uh, the AVCA. You can submit them to me, and I can forward them along at this email address. Uh, but uh, and actually, we're in transition at the office as well. Uh, our young lady who was in charge of Phenom for the last couple of years uh, uh, took a collegiate job. So uh, we're, we're replacing that person right now. So there's kind of a, a vacuum there, too. But I'm a great place to send those names and then I can forward them on. But otherwise, if they tested in a previous Phenom, uh, then they're automatically in if they want to come back, if they haven't signed yet. Uh, so there's multiple ways to get in, but, but the ABCA office has to know who you are before it's possible. Okay. That's good. Um, I think that's all I've got. Um, anything, any final comments you'd like to leave them with? Uh, just, I just encourage people to get into that database and just mess around. You can't mess it up. You can't do something that can't be undone. Go in and sort, take a look by year. Uh, you can kind of get an idea what that phenom crowd looked like last year, the year before, the year before that. All that data is kept in there. Uh, there's generally about a thousand athletes in that database as we roll athletes out that have signed, and then athletes in that are new. <clears throat> Keep in mind that uh, uh, we any of the college data that we've taken, you can't go in there and look at that. That's obviously proprietary, and one of the uh, agreements we had to be able to get that data was that we weren't going to publish, you know, Texas, University of Texas data to the entire country. So uh, that data obviously is, uh, you can't get into that. All you can see are the high school kids. Just so that's a, uh, so that's a question we get sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I can imagine that because, you know, you talked in the beginning about trying to, trying to benchmark against other teams at the level that you're trying to target. Yep. But it, it, without the the actual data itself, it's hard to to be too precise about it. You just kind of yeah. have to. And you you okay, can start with, look at their roster and right. <laughs> how tall are they? Right. <laughs> Maybe and you so, can get a sense of jump height. <laughs> you know, and most of us have, have been in this business long enough to to kind of get a sense of why a team is beating you, and whether it's because they're way quicker to the ball or whether it's because worse way slow getting to the pin or whether it's we can't you know dig a ball or we get a sense for what that is and what we need to improve upon yeah and the idea is to use this vpi within your own program to try to create that urgency in your own athletes that hey this is why we're not sitting in the top three of the conference every year it's always why we're in four and five and if we want to get to there then we've got to have these numbers match up yeah and you can you know if a kid has been in you know, is in the database or was in the database and you keep track of what players are being recruited by which teams for sure, at least get a sense of starting points. Yeah. Obviously not yep. the end point, but at least the starting points you need to know. So you can have a sense of where your recruiting targets might need to be. Yeah. And that's a good, that's a good point. I, the, when I gave the, when I gave a talk at last year's convention, uh, one of the coaches who'd never seen the database before came up to me afterward and said, hey, could you open up the database and let's go through this quick? And I opened it up, went to last year's Phenom, and a kid she had just signed four days before she got to convention, or at least in the previous month, was number two in that database. And she was so excited that a kid that she just signed was on that first page in the database. <laughs> and and that's that's one of those signals to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. moving in the right direction. I'm doing things right. Now let's take a look at the other athletes that are in that same VPI range, and let's go after mm -hmm. three more. Right. And if you can do that consistently, then you're going to see that, uh, that movement up in your roster. All right. Very good. All right. Thanks, Kyle. Appreciate you taking the time. Yep, it was a lot of fun. Yep, Hopefully we'll we'll get some uh, some folks over overseas to get in touch with you and, and see if they can work out some ways that they can start extending the use of EPI outside uh outside the US. Yep, that'd be fantastic. Send me an email.